Welcome to the first in a series of videos where I make the argument that the King James Version of the Bible is the best English version that we, sh we can use today. In this video, we're going to be looking at the teaching in some English versions of the Bible that if you rape a woman, she must be your wife. Now, some of you might be saying that sounds a little bit more like Islam than it does Christianity. Well, I agree with you. But this is something that the Bible, the Word of God, is being attacked by, you know, atheists and unbelievers. And it's worth looking at, why are they saying these things? And you say, Charles, where have they said this? Well, there's billboards being put up that say, lonely, need a companion. Well, rape any hot virgin and get a wife. And then they blasphemously put this dash God. And you say, that's blasphemous. For, for someone to say that, that's wicked. They should not put that on God. They should never say such a thing. They should not attribute such a teaching to God. Well, the CSB reads, if a man encounters a young woman, a virgin who is not engaged, takes hold of her and rapes her, and they are discovered, the man who raped her is to give her, is to give the young woman's father 50 shekels of silver and she will become his wife because he violated her. He cannot divorce her as long as he lives. This seems to, you know, straight out agree with that billboard, does it not? A man, you know, encounters a young woman, she's a virgin, he takes hold of her and rapes her. And, you know, when they're caught, hey, she's your wife now. You know, pay, pay the dad and get the woman. Uh, nothing more said here, and it, it really seems to be in agreement with what the atheist billboard says. The NIV says the same thing. It puts it in a rather odd way of, of phrasing it. If a man, you know, if a man happens to meet a virgin who's not pledged to be married and rapes her, you know, that's what the NIV says. The NET, well, suppose a man comes across a virgin who's not engaged and he overpowers her and rapes her. It's HCSB, which is an older version of the CSB, you know, if a man encounters a young woman, you know, a virgin who's not engaged, and he takes hold of her and rapes her, you know, and all these say that she must then become his, his wife. And that's really an odd teaching if you think about it, uh, especially when you compare it to other scriptures. And you might be asking yourself the question, what does the King James say? Well, the King James says, if a man find a damsel that is a virgin, which is not betrothed, and lay hold on her and lie with her, and they be found, then the then the man that lay with her shall give her, uh, shall give unto the damsel's father fifty shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife, because he hath humbled her, he may not put her away all his days. And this still may be confusing to some people, because they don't understand the general teaching here. And it's important to compare scripture with scripture. In Exodus 22, we find a similar teaching, where if a man entices a maid that is not betrothed, that means pledged to be another man's you know, wife, and lie with her, he shall surely endow her to be his wife, and uh, if her father utterly refused to give her unto him, he shall pay money according to the dowry of virgins. Now, it's also important to note that this is saying that she's not betrothed, which would make this almost equivalent to an act of adultery, which carries a much heftier, uh, much heavier price to pay. And when you compare these two accounts together, it makes it really obvious, you know, quickly what's going on. They're similar teachings. It's basically the same thing restated. This man and woman have come together out of wedlock and they have committed fornication. This man has taken the woman's virginity and now in that culture and even in ours today if you think about it, a woman who's promiscuous and basically acting like a whore is not viewed as, you know, the number one woman you want to marry. And back then she may have actually had a hard time finding a man to take care of her to pay the bills so to speak and bring home the food to. So this puts her in very dire circumstances going forward where she's known as, you know, used goods to other, other people and she may have trouble finding a, a husband. In which case, the father who must take care of this, this woman, you know, is to be paid a fine so that he can take care of her. No husband's going to come along and take care of her. So it only makes sense. The man who has laid with this woman has financially harmed the father of her and her. Now, there's the option given there that if they want to get married and the father's okay with it, then they can do that and it makes it right. But if not, the father might say, I don't want this deadbeat to marry my daughter. And he might accept the fine payment and they move along. 
This is a great difference between saying that a man just, you know, happens to come along and rapes a woman, and then that woman is now forced to marry that man. Radically different teaching. And if you compare scripture with scripture, there's no way to translate the underlying Hebrew word, you know, as rape. So we see that the CSB, the NIV, the NET, and the older version of the CSB all translate the underlying Hebrew word as rape and therefore do great damage to the Christian witness to our culture. You know, atheists are able to attack the word of God. People are going home grabbing their NIV off the shelf, looking up Deuteronomy 22, and lo and behold, it says exactly what that billboard blasphemously said. This is not the way it should be. This is not honoring to God. And you have to ask yourself, is this the translation that I should be using? You know, when you read the sign, you say, that's blasphemous. Well, how is it not blasphemous to translate that the way that those four modern versions have? You know, alternatively, the NASB and the ESV opt for seizes her, which is another possible translation of, you know, the underlying Hebrew word there that the King James translates, lay hold. You know, seizes her seems to be in the middle. It's not quite clear. Does that mean rape? Or does that mean, you know, another way of saying that he, you know, firmly came together with her? It's just shady enough to, you know, confuse a reader. And if someone's seen this billboard, went home and grabbed their NASB off the shelf, they're not going to come away, you know, too confident that it's much different. And you may ask yourself, what's lay hold of mean? Well, it's an idiom. That means simply to grasp someone or to or something with the hands, which I don't want to be graphic, but that definitely seems like sexual intercourse to me. And to be honest with you, one translation, which I don't recommend, the New Living Translation, actually translates this as intercourse. I would encourage you to go look it up on you know Bible Gateway or something. Don't waste your money on that terrible translation, but go look it up. And it's interesting that they opted to go with having intercourse here instead of rape in the New Living Translation, possibly because those those modern versions tend to interpret things for you. They don't give you the direct translation of what the word actually means, like the King James has here with lay hold, or even as the NASB and ESV have opted to try to do by saying, well, it could mean lay hold or it could mean seize, and we think seize is a better translation here. Unfortunately, as the translators chose uh, sees as the, as the translation, they have cast ambiguity upon the topic here and left it open to the possibility that this man may have raped this woman and forced her to be his wife. And therefore, atheists now have a foothold in blasphemously attacking the Word of God. There's no reason for it to be this way. And it's one of many reasons why the King James Version of the Bible remains to be superior today. A lot of people who work on these Bible translation committees are not even saved. They're not even believers. Some of them have homosexuals on the committee themselves. And they, you know, reach out to homosexuals for stylistic support. Or flaming liberals that you wouldn't even let speak in your church. Let alone would you want them tampering with the Bible. Further beyond that, there's lexicons that change the meaning of words. Um, And there's different manuscripts underlying these modern versions that radically change the text from which they even translate from. These modern versions are not the same thing. They're not just updated English. They actually do change the meaning of many verses and strip away many verses from the Bible. This is just one of many reasons why I believe that the King James Version is greater than other modern versions. Until next time, God bless.